I believe it's time for us to begin. Uh, glad to see everyone back again this afternoon. Uh, if you're visiting with us, uh, we're glad that you chose to spend this time with us. If you're on, watching us on the internet, uh, we're glad that you're watching us and visiting with us on the internet. Just a few announcements and then we'll have our song service and then Gary will provide a, a little lesson. Uh, remember uh, Malcolm uh, and Sue and, and, uh, and Malcolm's visit to the uh, to Houston in December, the, December the 30th for his surgery that's going to be on January the 3rd. Uh, also remember HD and, and the entire family and, and the loss of Miss Lada. Uh, also uh, keep in prayer Loretta Covington, the, the friend of uh, Shannon Brown, uh, in a prayer she's having health issues. And Jacob uh, Conger is, is home after his surgery uh, and his, his appendix was removed. Uh, the uh, sister of Jill Chase, Sherry uh, Gilmore, uh, has, uh, has some issues that she's dealing with, health issues that she's dealing with. And also remember Susan Phillips and her brother uh, Paul Cox, uh, who uh, has been sent home. He's been sent home and is in hospice care uh, at this time. Um, let's also pray for Alan and Brittany Bates. She's getting close. And so I know there's a lot of anxious moments there. Uh, uh, tonight after service, uh, the snack is going to meet somewhere. I do not know. Uh, Logan probably could tell me that, but I don't even see him. So, okay. Uh, the um, care guard, care card care group number three uh, meets after after services tonight in B1. Uh, and also remember, this Wednesday night we're going to meet. This is regular regular Wednesday night services. No change like we do sometimes during uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, also, too, and last but not least, uh, the copy of the 2022 budget is on the table in the foyer. If you've not gotten, already gotten one of those, uh, you can pick one of those up on the way out uh, later on. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for again to have this opportunity to come and worship you, and we pray that as we do, we would uh, do that in, in spirit and in truth. We pray that we could focus our minds on totally on uh, the Gary's lesson and uh, as we he teaches us, and as he brings the, the gospel to us, that we would have our minds open and our hearts open, be receptive to the, uh, the things that he's prepared for to, uh, to, to teach to us about in just a few minutes. Father, we pray that you'd be with all those that I just went over and being sick and those having health issues, and we pray that you would give them a measure of comfort and, and, and give them a peace of mind in knowing that uh, sometimes it just takes a little, a little extra time to, to heal and to just... Uh, process of going through surgeries and the traveling back and forth and all of that so that they will just have a, a peace of mind. Uh, also, we pray that you'd be with uh, <clears throat> us as we, a lot of us travel during the holidays, and we pray that you'd be with each one of uh, the church family here as they're on the road and, and give us all a, a safe trip to and fro from our, um, our meeting for when we go from here and there. Father, we pray that you'd continue to be with us throughout this, uh, throughout this service and forgive us when we fall short of your expectations. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. First song this evening will be number 662. 662. Here's our spinning vanity and pride, carry now my Lord was crucified, knowing that it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great, grace was free.
Father, we're so blessed and honored, Father, to be here in your presence. We thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to come, Father, in good health. Father, showing our faithfulness, showing our love for you. We thank you, Lord, for this congregation here. We pray, Father, that as we continue to strive to make heaven our home, we pray, Father, that we will continue to make, make saving souls our focus, Father, for we know, Father, that pleases you. We ask you, Father, as we continue to go through this service, that we lift up our voices, Father, and sing to you because you're so worthy. We ask you, Father, to just be with the ones who've lost loved ones. Be with Brother HD, Father, for we know it's a, it's a change, Father. It's going to be a little adjusting, a lot of adjusting to get through, through Father, but with our help, showing him our love, we pray, Father, we can make it easier on him. We pray for all the ones who lost loved ones who are going through um, different ailments and surgeries and so much going on with this, this virus. We pray, Father, that we would just can continue to keep you first, Father, keep our, all of our hope and all of our faith in you. Forgive us for our sins, Father. We pray, Father, that as we continue to go out in this world that we will, allow, we will let our light shine, shine, Father, for we know sometimes, Father, Satan can come at us and, and make us start to believe that we're not showing our faithfulness or we're not letting our light shine, Father. But, but when the world can see where your heart is and where your love, we know it's you, Father, reminding us, Father, that just keep pressing on. We ask your Father to be your brother Gary as he comes before us tonight to break up unto us your word, Father. We pray that you would just be with him, that he remember the things that he studied. Father, he could say something, Father, to, to motivate us, to encourage us, Father, and to help us to continue on this battlefield. Forgive us for our sins, Father, and we ask you to just watch over us and guide us and protect us as we go through this night and through this week. For us in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Psalm before Mr. Gary's lesson tonight will be number six, the last and did my Savior bleed. And if you're using a songbook, 
um, Song of Invitation will be number 681, 681. If you would, please stand. you think about it, but I think it's pretty good when a congregation has a guy like Dustin who can come off the bench and do that good a job. And I'm serious. He does a good job. And uh, he didn't, he wasn't slated uh, necessarily lead singing tonight. Uh, Drew's got a sick one at home, and so he's out, and Derek's out with sickness, and uh, that's, that's two gone real quick, you know, in the bunch, but he stepped right up and did a good job, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful we've, we're blessed. Uh, I've been in congregations where they struggle to have one song leader, you know, at all. And if he was out, we were in trouble because then they're going to let the preacher do it. And, and most people left before the sermon when that happens. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're blessed here. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, Logan, I guess they know where Snack is up. Top? Okay, up top. All right. That's, that fixed that one thing that we didn't know. Okay. So I didn't know either. I don't usually go to the young people's snack. But <laughs> anyway, oh, it, is, it is great to be here. It really is. Hey, listen, uh, I, I'll, just to let everybody know, uh, if, if I have a credit card company that lets me know I can spend all I want to spend, we're going to form a caravan up here Friday morning. All you that were offended because I didn't name your name, you know, we'll, it's okay. We'll form a caravan, and you will. We'll, I'll go in the church bus, and you follow along, and we'll just we'll just charge as we go. But I doubt that's going to happen. Okay, so <laughs> illustration only. But anyway, but it pointed out something, and I hope you saw that this morning uh, that that the purpose of Jesus coming in the flesh is really for us. That he did not come for himself. And now tonight, I want us to see that ultimately what you could say is he was born to die. 
Now, there's a sense in which you could say about every human being that ever walks on the face of the earth that there, we are born to die. We will die. It's a, it's a natural part of life. The writer of Hebrews talks about it. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. But Jesus was uniquely born to die. And he talks about that in the book of John. And I want you, if you will, to stick your finger in chapter 12 of the book of John. We're going to keep coming back to that all the way through tonight. Things that happened at the cross. And this is what Jesus lets us know. And we find particularly that Jesus died a necessary death. All right, watch this. Starting in John chapter 12, verse 20. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Now, pause just a minute. If they were Greeks that came to worship at the feast, the chances are pretty good they were proselytes. I didn't say they are because John doesn't tell us that. But because they came to the feast, that would seem to be highly likely. But listen to what they want. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. I want all of us to note the commendable idea that these Greek worshipers had in mind. We want to see Jesus. I hope everybody in this audience tonight, whether online or right here in person, that we all can honestly say, I want to see Jesus. That's the most important thing. Don't ever, I don't care who it is, that counts me, don't ever let a man step in this pulpit or in a classroom or wherever it may be, and make the focus be about anything other than Jesus. Because that's what the church is about. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. And we don't want to forget that. We want to strive with all of our might to see Jesus. But now begin to notice what happens in verse 23. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now, what do I get out of this? Here's what I see Jesus doing. He knows what they want. They want to see Jesus. And here is what I believe Jesus is saying. You cannot fully see me without the death, the burial, and the resurrection. The Son of Man's hour has come. He's been pointing this hour throughout the book of John over and over again. He keeps talking about, I'm here for a certain purpose. I'm here to go through a certain time period. It's here now. And if you really want to see Jesus, just wait, because he's going to be revealed in all his glory and in all the glory of God at the point of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And he goes on, in verse 24, he explains why that is when he says, Most assured I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And so as Jesus elaborates on this, he explains why the hour is so important. And the importance of it is seen in a fact of nature. It's the same fact, interesting enough, that the Apostle Paul brings up in the great discussion of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that is that a grain has to die in order to produce more fruit, in order to live in a different form, true enough. But in order to live, one kernel of corn can be placed in the ground, and, and when it dies, it can become a hundred or more whatever is on an, an ear, or if there's more than one ear on the stock, then there'd be even more that would be present. 
Jesus is saying, in order to really see me, you're going to have to see my body. And how's that going to take place? Well, when I die, then many people, truthfully, people from all walks of life, from all nationalities, are all going to be able to ultimately glorify God because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What happened at the cross? Well, I can tell you one thing for sure that happened at the cross, and that is Jesus died a necessary death. But then also, Jesus' name was glorified. Now, we come to a section here uh, with which I don't think many people are familiar. John, the book of John is probably the least studied and yet maybe the richest of all the, the gospel accounts because its purpose is to, is to shore up and to strengthen the belief, seems to me, of Christians. Those are the ones that, that John seems to be writing to and reaffirming their faith in Jesus Christ. So listen to what he records for us, beginning of verse 27 of John 12. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You know, Jesus really, in the book of John, more than once comes to this idea. To Look back to John chapter 5, if you would, just briefly. And I want us to observe what transpires there as there is a discussion. Jesus, of course, says in verse 17, my father's been working until now, and I've been working. The Jews who are present, those Jewish leaders, those Pharisees and scribes and others, concluded he was blaspheming. Why? He made himself equal to God. Does Jesus deny it? No. Watch what he says. Pick up, if you would, at verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not under the Father who sent him. Listen, God had been working in the entire life of Jesus on earth to cause him to be glorified. How did he do that? Well, he let Jesus uh, have the power to raise the dead, for example. He gave Jesus the power to judge the world at the end of the time. For another example, God is constantly uh, glorifying Jesus through the works that he does. Because why? Because Jesus is doing what God wants him to do. Jesus focuses on doing the will of the Father. So now go back to chapter 12. And remember now, he's asked the Father, glorify my name. Now watch, here comes the answer into verse 28. When God responds, then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. I want us to look at what I believe is one of a remarkable fact of Scripture and the life of Jesus. Notice the beginning of Jesus' ministry. That's when he goes to be baptized of John in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 3. What happens there? The Spirit descends like a dove, and a voice out of heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Did God glorify the Son? Yes. At the beginning of the ministry, He glorified the Son. Let's go to the middle of the ministry. This time we're in Matthew chapter 17. Uh, Peter, James, John, and Jesus have gone up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And before them, Jesus is transfigured. He glows 
uh, because of being in the presence of his father. And when Peter suggests that they build three tents, one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus, then all of a sudden Moses and Elijah are gone and a voice from heaven. What does it say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Did God glorify Jesus at the middle of his ministry? The answer to that's easy. Yes, of course he did. So the Father from heaven now says, I have glorified and I will glorify. When's that going to happen? Turn over to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 13, the apostle Paul is in Antioch of Pisidia. He's delivering a powerful sermon. Maybe one day I'll break that whole sermon down, but not tonight. Don't panic. Uh, that sermon is a beautiful, beautiful sermon about Jesus, the Son of God. And particularly, we want to pick up at verse 33. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. That is, as is written in the second Psalm, thou art, or you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He has spoken to us. I'll give you the sure mercies of David. When is the Father going to glorify Jesus again? At the resurrection. That's when he's going to do it. And guess what? It's going to be undeniable. You can, that, no, that's not to say people won't deny it. But they're denying reality at that point. Uh, that is exactly what they're doing because God is stating beyond a shadow of a doubt when he raises Jesus from the dead, this is my son. So you hear Paul, for example, Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, talking about the great resurrection from the dead and how that God, through the spirit of holiness, caused Jesus to be raised up. So God says, I have glorified you and I will glorify you. And he did, didn't he? So you and I ought to really focus on that glorified one, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. But we don't want to miss out on one more verse. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, the writer to those early Hebrew Christians who must have been tempted to go back. Let's just go back to Moses. A whole lot easier back there than it was right at this moment for Christians. And here's a part of the writer's answer to that kind of thinking. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste of death for every man. Jesus went to the tomb. I think at that point, Satan and all his forces rejoice. Read the book of Revelation sometime. It's my contention that that is depicted in Figurative language, but it's depicted pretty clearly that the, the forces of Satan are going to basically dance in the streets because Jesus is dead. Boy, they have won the victory. But guess what? Three days later, guess who won? Not them. Jesus came out of the tomb. And when he came out of the tomb, all of us could rejoice. And all of us can celebrate. Why? Why? Because Jesus Christ tasted of death for every man. And now God glorifies his name. And I'm going to go a step further. He'll glorify everybody that remains true to him. And so you see that argued in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, particularly verse 10. What happened at the cross? Jesus died a necessary death. Jesus' name was glorified, but then the Lord goes on to say, Satan was judged. I want us to look at this. Look at back at John chapter 12. We'll now pick up at verse 29. And here's what Jesus goes on to say. Now, of course, the people first have a response. Therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. See, folks don't know what's going on. Now, Jesus explains it. Watch what he does. The next verse. Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. 
Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast down. Wow. Until Jesus was raised from the dead, the devil had death hanging over every man. He had every man exactly where he wanted him. But when Jesus came to his hour, when he went to the cross, as we've already said, we're going to say it again, it looked like the devil won. But three days later, it was just the opposite. The devil had lost. He was defeated. Now, the devil is, an, is a character... Uh, that we ought to pay attention to, not because we want to follow him, but because we need to be warned. He's described in Scripture in various ways. For example, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he's described as the God of this age. You want to know why people are mean? You want to know why they do hateful and hurtful things? I can tell you, they're following the devil. That's why. They've yielded their lives to the God of this age. But he's not just described that way. In the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verse 19, John describes him in, you know, typical John way. Very simple, but very powerful. He describes him as the wicked one. And boy, he is that. He is wicked. And if you join forces with him, you will be in the depths of wickedness I think I recall that when Peter and John uh, went to the sea of Samaria, and you may remember that uh, Simon the sorcerer saw that they were able to cause people to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, your know, miraculous gifts, by the laying on of their hands. And he said, I want some of that. Let me buy some. And what did Paul, Peter say? He said, I perceive you're in the gall of bitterness. You're right in the heart of wickedness. It's going to eat you up. And boy, did he impress Simon because Simon said, pray for me that this won't happen. I'm begging you to pray for me. And we ought to recognize that following Satan ought to cause us to tremble because of where we're headed if we stay on that side. That's part of what Jesus is warning. I found something in this study uh, that, that uh, amazed me, not because it hadn't been there the whole time, but because as many times as I've read it, I hadn't seen it. And I don't know, you may have seen it. You may say, well, preacher, you are really not too smart, are you? But go with me, if you will, to the book of John, chapter 3. Here's Nicodemus. He's come to Jesus by night. They've had an interesting discussion. Remember, you must be born again. He's talked about how the man, Son of Man's got to be raised up or lifted up like the serpent was lifted up by Moses in the wilderness. That's an obvious reference to the crucifixion. But you go on down to verse 19, still talking to Nicodemus. Here's what we find. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Here is the thing that I see. The cross forces a choice. And the choice is light or darkness. You make a pick. Every individual gets to choose. Are you going to choose light or are you going to choose darkness? Jesus said the light came into the world. Some people didn't, didn't accept the light. They liked the darkness. They liked living a wicked life. And so they rejected it. Well, the cross makes us make a choice. Tonight, every person in this audience will, before they leave, if you're not already, make a choice about Christ. You're going to make a choice to go come to the light where he is or to go with darkness. It's one or the other. The devil wants you to take his side, but I'm telling you, he lost. He lost at Calvary. He was defeated. He was judged. His side will not win. 
You want to summarize the book of Revelation in two words? We won. That's it. That's the totality of it. And why did we win? Because Jesus conquered the grave. What happened at the cross? Satan was judged. And then, at the cross, men were drawn to Jesus. Listen to it. John chapter 12. Pick up at verse 32 and then verse 33. This he said, excuse me, verse 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Pause just a minute. What's he talking about? Well, John's going to tell us. So let's let him explain it by inspiration. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So Jesus is saying, if I go to the cross, if I'm lifted up, I'm going to draw all, now watch this, all peoples. Ooh, all peoples? Jews and Gentiles? That's what he said. All peoples will be drawn unto me. Now, when Jesus said that, men didn't understand it. Listen to the very next verse, verse 34. The people answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? See, you got to give the people credit. Somewhere or another, they're, they're connecting or they're trying to connect Son of Man and the Messiah. They really have it right if they can put those two together. They've got the point. But they have a problem with that. Because as they understand the prophets, the Messiah is going to live forever. Well, guess what? They got that right too. He is going to live forever. But when's he going to become Messiah? Was Jesus the Messiah completely at, at or before the cross? And my answer would be no. Now, there's a sense in which you can say he's God's anointed. David was anointed long before he became king. But Jesus didn't officially become king until he conquered death. And thus it is that on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter stood up and said, uh, Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. You starting to put all this together? They got it. They understood it. And now that he is reigning, will he ever die again? Shake your head this way. He's not going to die again. That's not going to happen. He's going to live forever. So that the writer of Hebrews later, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, I believe it is, maybe 3. You need to double check me. Hebrews 13 for sure. says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Never changing, not anymore. Died one time, that's true enough, but never again. He's going to live forever. Now, he will deliver up his rule to the Father. That's what Paul talks about. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but he's going to live forever. So they got that right, but they don't understand. How can the Son of Man have to die if he's going to live and reign forever? Well, they just don't understand when the rain starts. And so Jesus begins to explain to them, verses 35 and 36, Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. The light's here. As long as he's here, you've got an opportunity to come to the light. Where's the light? That's where God is. Look at 1 John. Pretty clear, isn't it? 1 John chapter 1. Where's the light? It's where God is. By the way, it's not just chapter 1. In 1 John, it's in every chapter. He talks about God being in the light, and those who want to be with God are in the light. They're not in darkness. Don't follow that path. 
So that's Jesus' answer. I don't think they understood it. And I'm not sure that we always put it all together. Let me notice another thing, and I've got it up here, intentionally put it on your outline so you'd be able to see it. That is, after Jesus was resurrected, then the Holy Spirit shows us how to walk in the light. Now, Jesus talking about if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all peoples unto myself, right? How does God draw people to Jesus or to himself? The answer to that is told by Jesus himself, John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. How does God draw you to himself? You got to hear and learn. Now, put that together with what Jesus is saying and continues to say in the next few chapters about the Holy Spirit. Go down to chapter 14, verse 26, and listen to him talk about the Holy Spirit. Here's what he says. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. How are we going to get the light? The Spirit's going to give it to us. Why is that? Well, if you go on down and read chapter 15, and especially chapter 16, you're going to find out the apostles weren't ready for all the light yet. They weren't ready to receive everything yet. But when the Holy Spirit comes, who does he talk about? Does he talk about himself? Does he establish a new doctrine separate, separate and apart from Jesus Christ? No. Instead, he establishes and confirms and expands upon Jesus' doctrine, letting them know everything that's involved in being in the light. What happened at the cross? At the cross, men were drawn to Jesus. By what? By the teaching of the Word of God, a teaching that was inspired by the Spirit of God. The cross, then, is central to everything that you and I believe and follow. It is central in that it says Jesus had to die a necessary death. It says that Jesus' name would be glorified, and it was at the cross. It says that Satan would be judged, and he was, and he was defeated. He lost. And it says, ultimately, that we are drawn to Jesus because of what happened at the cross, drawn by the Word of God, to the Son of God, so that we can have hope. So tonight, anybody that wants to have hope, who's a member of the church, but has kind of drifted away, how do you come back? You follow the Word. You listen to the Spirit. And you come back to the light by confessing your sin. Isn't that what John says, 1 John 1, 9? It is. And then what about if you're outside of Christ? Well, you've got to acknowledge Jesus is the King. You do that by repenting of your sins and putting him on under the authority of his name in baptism. That's what Peter said, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Tonight, you can come to know the riches of the cross if you'll come while we sing. Just as I am.
close this song that will be number 483. If you have not been able to protect the Lord's Supper, it's been left prepared. Um, Chris or John Mark will be in the back. And after this, we'll be led in prayer by Mr. Sam Clark. 483. Stand up, stand up. Father and God, we thank you for life itself. We thank you that we fellowship with Christians and that today at this place and around the world, all the saints have offered worship that is accessible in thy sight. We praise, Father, therefore, that we have been edified and resolved to Go forth as we enter a new year, determined to come to the light, that we would be enamored to resist temptation, that we would walk in the steps of Jesus. We pray, Father, that our two brothers, Brother Hurley and Brother Hood, would we receive comfort in their loneliness and in their grief that as they deal with the lifetime of a departed sister that they could take comfort as Paul told the Corinthians that we would all one day rise to meet him in the air. Father forgive us when we fail to resist temptation. Pray Father that we would have penitent hearts and your grace would abound, that we would be forgiven and determined to do better. Father, provide for the safety of those who are traveling in this upcoming holiday and the safety of us all, that we may be able to meet again at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> 